everyone, I hope you're well. Today I'm talking with Peter S. Hughes. Um, we're talking, this is part one of a longer conversation. So part two will be out in a few weeks. So stick around for that. Uh, that will be talking about Alfred North Whitehead and psychedelics, whereas today we're talking about Spinoza, albeit there is convergence and sort of um, a synergy between all of these ideas. Um, right yeah. Okay, so yeah, I mean, Peter, you, you, I mean, um, as I say, I've only, I haven't read all your work. I've read uh, a fair bit, I think, and I've read some other stuff. Yeah, you've put online, and I'll link some of all of this stuff for those who, who would like to go and read more. Um, and yeah, you you sort of cover, I mean, quite a, a range of sort of topics um, and and sort of I'd say maybe authors. I mean, it's it's it seems as though Spinoza, Whitehead. And then your Twitter suggests Nietzsche is um, mm. of, of a interest. I thought I'd start though, I'd just for my own curiosity. Do you? I mean, do you remember your first sort of like philosophical thought, or kind of like the first maybe like book? Like the you know when you, is there a point in time yeah. where you really you look back and you go, okay, that was the start of when I was I realised I was probably going to get get quite passionate about philosophy. Yeah, I, I sort, of, sort of actually. I mean. So when I was a child, my mother told me that I was known as a little philosopher, so always questioning these things. But um, my father was, um, he was a painter, an artist, and he was, he was, you know, philosophically minded. He didn't, he didn't study it or anything. But um, he, uh, I remember like one, one thought he said about, you know, the clock going round when I was a child, like, you know, clock going round sort of mirroring the, the rotation of planets and sun and so on, the solar system. That got me thinking a little bit. <laughs> so there was that. And then he had this book, he was interested in, eastern uh, philosophy so i remember this book he had nana yoga that i read as a sort of young teenager i guess which mm. was about you know mind and body and so on and um you know that really that actually really started my interest i think um and you know when i was 17 i was looking in britain here for to, to study eastern philosophy actually um but it wasn't really available at the time so I did the second best thing I thought, which was Western philosophy, which I'd never, you know, they don't teach at schools in England at all. They do in Germany and Sweden, you know, half Swedish, but um, in England, they didn't do that. So I um, so I didn't know what it was about, but I thought I'd take a chance. And um, and uh, yeah, just completely fell in love with it, really. Um, that's why I read Nietzsche, you know, to start with and uh, Kant and uh, all these, all this canon, you know, Berkeley and all those lot. So yeah, that's how I got into it. But it was yeah, I suppose yeah, my father, my father, and my mother got me interested. I think I would have had natural interest in it anyway. And then university, just bam, look at this, you know, this mm. ontological shock, really. Yeah, yeah, ontological shock. I like that phrase, especially yeah. from Britain. Um, you know, especially from Britain. I think Britain's particularly non-philosophical, actually, compared to the continent. Really? Mm. Unfortunately, that's interesting. Do you, do you mean presently or even like historically as well? I, th I think historically to a certain extent. Who was it who actually, I think it was um, a famous writer who, 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 who claimed this actually in 1940s. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, England, Britain's always been quite empirical. Uh, like if it is philosophical, it's generally on the empiricist side and positive side in the 20th century. Um, and practical, yeah. you know, and I think that's partly due, probably, there's speculation now, but there's there's these interesting arguments that Britain has been pretty um, uh, capitalist, you know, inverted commas, mm -hmm. from like very early on, like, you know, before, you know, certainly before the Reformation. Um, and that has kind of made us think in practical terms, perhaps. I don't know. But anyway, that's uh, interesting. Uh, I think I think there's an interesting history of Britain and non-speculative thought, which you don't find in Germany. It's like the opposite of Germany, which is very speculative. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. It oh, is almost but... like yeah, they're quite polar opposites in a way, aren't they? To an extent, particularly like um, yeah, the sort of like German uh, sort of idealism and um, yeah, I often yeah. think that I often think it would be so great if I if I'd grown up speaking German just because of the mm. amount of um, yeah, literature there is. I mean, yeah, yeah. even to be honest, even to an extent when it sort of spills into psychology and stuff, you know, you think of like young, you know, even in, in, in the 20th century, whilst, you know, there was a, like you say, quite a sort of like there was the, the positivistic kind of like thinking and, you know, there was sort of this uh, beacon of, or he was like a sort of, um, yeah, a beacon of sort of like idealism, albeit he didn't necessarily proffer himself to be an idealist, I don't think, um, at least 
explicitly. Anyway, but yeah, that's really interesting. Um, and... George Orwell, George Orwell, something came to me, was the guy, the writer, the famous writer who said Britain was particularly non-philosophical, I remember now, yeah. Right. But just a quick little yeah. caveat to that, I mean, you know, in the in the late 19th, early uh, 20th century, from about 1875 to 1925, you had in Oxbridge and in Scotland, um, absolute idealism, which was he basically Hegelianism coming into Britain. And that did take take hold, you know, in the universities for about 50 yeah. years. Um, but then after the wars, it kind of completely, completely lost it. And actually the English reaction to it was, you know, logical positivism, really, which said that metaphysics was nonsense. You know, AJ wrote an article along those lines in the 1930s. But uh, yeah, there's, which is it, which I'm, are... sure, I'm sure there's PhD studies about the sort of uh, non theoretic speculative philosophical culture of Britain I'm sure, I'm sure that exists because um it's the case yeah and I think that's why your what your work and you know how you've sort of uh written a, on you know Spinoza and and then and, but just talking about this what we we're just talking about there about this sort of like the cultures I think and um that's for example Whitehead you know it's like even amidst that culture there have been individuals who have sort of stood against it and sort of like but maybe they didn't quite catch on, and um, yeah, well, think, yeah. Why? Well, it's yeah. a very interesting example because you know he he had, he was he he was um, brought up in uh, Kent and uh, from a lineage of pastors, and he was you know Church of England Anglican um, until he moved to Cambridge University, where he was part of this um, group, the Apostles, which were allowed to question everything, you know, on these secret societies. Like John Toland was also part of that in the seventeen early seventeen hundreds. I mean, they've existed when Christianity has has forbidden that free thought i think in britain that's another whole component of this as well but um yeah whitehead you know he, he sort of moved away from christianity then to a kind of uh, agnosticism and then he returned to a kind of strange like pantheism you could say or panentheism some people say um but you know he moved he, he he developed his metaphysics when he moved from britain to um america to harvard university and then you know he died in 1947 and then, you know, the Europeans, the British, were completely uninterested in his work. And um, his student, student, Wittgenstein, took over, really, like a lot of thought here in the philosophy language. And only only recently have people become interested in Whitehead again. There has been this mm. American kind of Center for Process Studies, that I'm affiliated with a little bit, mm. um, which kind of maintained his philosophy, but they turned it into a kind of process theology. You know, they mixed it with Wesleyanism. Um, but, you know, really interesting things happened the last 20 years, which I, I still can't quite get my head around, which is that in China, they have opened 35, I think it's 35 Whitehead centres in the last 20 years. What? Uh, yeah. <laughs> That's incredible. It's, it's quite incredible, isn't it? And uh, it's related to the fact that they find an overlap in Whitehead's process philosophy with Daoism. Um, but, yeah, quite an unexpected... Um, emergence really yeah i wonder um if if we're on whitehead if we talk about whitehead i i, I was gonna say because only because historically speaking if you know i suppose philosophy is always in a sense situated historically um and sometimes that can afford or help understand why a person's work might um particularly catch on or not catch on um I don't know. Should we talk about Spinoza first? Do you think, or should we talk about what? Oh, do you want to, what just... Let's get Spinoza first, as he's you know chronolo chronologically first, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah, and so so, okay, so yeah. How would how do you okay? I say I would, I would say maybe could you explain Spinoza and his worldview? But perhaps there's a lot to that. So maybe um, the parts that you typically speak upon and what you what how you first came to it and what attracted to it, I guess. Mm. Yeah, interestingly, I, I came to Spinoza having read Whitehead first. Or when I say having read Whitehead, I mean having studied Whitehead for years before I moved into studying Spinoza in detail. Of course, you read like the basics, at, you know, as an undergrad or whatever. But um, but I think, you know, the order in which you study philosophers actually is quite important in the sense that you a person can't help but bring their understanding of, of, of former philosophies into their interpretation of new ones. So um, as opposed to, you know, I know someone, Michael Halewood, for example, Tommy, he he read, you know, chronologically, as maybe you should, you know, Spinoza first and then Whitehead. And then uh, as a result, we have slightly understanding, different understandings of both. But um, yeah, so... Um, 
what brought me to Spinoza and what, what can he present the modern world? Well, first of all, you know, Einstein said, you know, he's a Spinozist. You know, he, he, he even wrote these love poems to Spinoza. He's completely enamored, um, as were many, many thinkers, philosophers, Borges, for example. Um, Deleuze wrote two books about Spinoza. Whitehead's based on Spinoza to a certain extent. You know, anyway, Spinoza. Um, the word pantheism, that God is nature, was coined by an English guy called Joseph Raphson. 20 years after Spinoza died. But when he coined it, pantheism, God is nature, he referred to both Eastern philosophy, the Vedas, and Spinozism. And um, so in a way, in the West, you could say that um, pantheism really refers first to Spinoza. Of course, you get pantheists in the past with Stoics and, you know, the Neoplatonists and whatnot. But the idea is that God is nature, but by God is not meant a personal God, as you find in the Abrahamic religions. It's rather meant... Um, in my interpretation, a sort of um, a universal mind, like um, which is, again, not like a human mind at all, but a, a sort of, it's in modern terms, called cosmopsychism, you know. God is nature. Um, that got him into trouble. He was excommunicated by his fellow Jews. He was His books were banned by the church. Um, to say, to profess you were a Spinozist from in the um, 16th, 17th century would get you into a lot of trouble. But in the 1780s um, occurred this so-called pantheism controversy where people, uh, someone accused someone else of being a Spinozist, Jacob uh, accused, um, what was it, Lessing of being a Spinozist and uh, all hell broke loose. <laughs> mm -hmm. But then all these intellectuals came in like Goethe and, and so on and started reading Spinoza and said, actually, you know, he's 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 got quite a logical uh, mindset and I don't know why we've um, demonized him so much. So what? why? Well, it's very parsimonious view. God is nature. So there's no God outside of nature. Nature is everything. It's a monism in that sense. There's, And this is in in a part a reaction against Cartesian dualism. So, you know, De Descartes argued that, you know, mind and body were separate substances, so they could exist on their own. You, you know, once the body died, the soul could exist in an afterlife, whatever. For Spinoza, mind and body, or thoughts and extension, to use the old-fashioned words, um, were expressions of one substance just like the morning star and the evening star are different expressions of venus so they're not separate substances so that brings a nice parsimony in um but by by body um he means matter um the latin is corpus which can mean both body and matter right and um and so so that means that every aspect of matter including your body has this mental um um expression but it also means all of everything that is material has a mental expression as well, which entails, although Spinoza didn't go into it much, he did mention it, but um, it entails that, you know, plants, for example, have basic forms of sentience and so on. And that's what we call today panpsychism, which is a coin turned by Petrucci um, earlier than Spinoza, actually. But um, so there's a pantheism in Spinozism. Pantheism really is named after Spinozism. There's a panpsychism that merge, emerges out of it, that nature is alive, all aspects of nature are alive, which means you don't need a brain for consciousness. You need a brain for human consciousness, but not for all consciousness. Um, and um, individual units are differentiated by what he calls canatus, which is like a drive to persist in oneself, a bit like Nietzsche's will to power. So there's this kind of underlying will that differentiates beings. And, um, and so... And, and, you know, like um, people have tried to make this kind of monism, this, this absolute monism, you can call it, um, like the basis of Western science, but have failed. Um, there was a big attempt in the 19th, uh, 19th century by, um, by, by certain individuals to do that, but it failed. And so we still have materialism as the kind of so, you know, like unwitting, subconscious, underlying metaphysic of science today. And and for Spinoza, well, the material is, is real, but it's merely one expression of a greater totality. So with Spinozism, you would expect you like to, to find neural correlates of consciousness, of course, because, you know, mind and matter are essentially the same thing, but you just wouldn't restrict it to the human being or, or animals even, you know, it would go all the way down. And then all the way up, there's what he calls the infinite intellect. So there's that's the sort of anima mundi, the soul of the world, as it were, in a monist sense, you know, cosmic consciousness.
it's interesting to trace that word and cosmic consciousness you know like a trope in psych 60s psychedelia that people trace it back to Aaron Buck who wrote a book with the same name 1901 but actually goes back to um, von Hartmann who was a Schopenhauerian Hegelian philosopher and mm -hmm. you know you find this notion of eternal consciousness in Hegel it's Geist and Hegel himself really is 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 drawing I think in my in my view it's drawing upon Spinoza's substance you know so Spinoza's substance which is the universe which is God which is mind um is static in in, in Spinoza but Hegel made it a kind of evolving rationally evolving yeah uh that perhaps had you know um interesting historical influences on our general theory of evolution Nietzsche famously said not famously Nietzsche said that without Hegel there would be no Darwin and I'll add that without Spinoza, there'd be no Hegel. So, uh, yeah, that's a general outline, I think. Yeah, 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 um, yeah. But that's really basically, God is nature, mind is matter, um, and uh, and the universe is much more than either mind or matter. I mean, one more thing I should add: mind and matter are two expressions of this one substance that he also calls God, that mm. he also calls nature. But um, we are only privy to two expressions or attributes of that mind and matter thought and extension but there's an infinity of other expressions of that same substance that other creatures with different we would today say with different evolutionary lineages would would perceive you know so yeah yeah interesting and um because you talk there about uh i think as you say so he he's essentially almost like a many aspect monist it's just that we're only sort of dual aspect monist because we only have we're only privy yeah. to two aspects that's right um, yeah. and uh, of which um aspects of this sort of substance um though at the beginning i think you said when you're outlining spinoza i think you said it's almost like the the universe is a mind or has a mind and and i think i've heard you say before whilst he says that um mind or human mind is an aspect that he does almost in some way make reference to how mind is the most sort of I don't know what the has the most weight or something as a as a attribute or is that if I, is that not true? Um, that's actually a matter of debate in Spinoza circles. Quite interesting. So, um, yeah, some Spinoza scholars argue that, and actually, in the nineteenth century, Spinoza scholars generally um, interpreted Spinoza as a kind of idealist, where yeah, mentality would be seen as the most fundamental attribute. Um, I'm kind of neutral on this, so I call it sometimes neutral monism, coming from Russell, meaning something else. But but um, I think that, you know, like I say, mind is just one expression, matter is just one expression. There's It seems to be equal in the expressions. Spinoza himself doesn't seem to, he never explicitly um, gives more weight to mind uh, than matter. And some people actually, you know, I talk about this idealist um, interpretation. Today, you get a lot of mechanist interpretations of Spinoza who put more weight on the material side. So oh, okay. um, depends who you talk to. But um, I, there's something to be said about if the essence of of um, God is, you know, mind, some form of thought or feeling or, you know, some, a lot of people say God is love, you know. That implies mind. So, you know, behind all things, behind all expressions, there is this essence of God. But I think it's actually higher than that. I think um, the actual essence of substance is sort of meta-mental, ultimately. But that means it's something that we can't even imagine, you know, because we are, if you're a Spinozist, you are limited in your imagination to, to, to those two expressions. But that's where, and that's also interestingly where Spinoza differs from idealism. Hmm. By, by believing in this yeah meta mental substance and hegel didn't though i mean hegel hegel, hegel it was geist mind spirit you know which was fundamental what yeah it's um yes it, I, I always find this conversation so interesting because at any point there's so many ways we can go we can go um but it, it, with uh you talk about uh, uh hegel i'm just who comes to mind and i know um you, you've you've mentioned you've read him and i think i've seen recently you've tweeted uh pages of his books um uh, Schopenhauer um, mm. and this uh, substance is akin almost to will and 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 and, um, and it's interesting because what I read online was apparently um, I think you mentioned the Vedas earlier but I think at some point in time I don't know how soon after Spinoza people came to realize it was very akin to um, uh, almost like the, what the Upanishads talk about you know like this sort of like Brahman and stuff yeah. um, and 
and it's interesting because I think um, you, I, I was then thinking I then kind of when I read that I thought oh, okay that's interesting because I've I've got the Upanishads and I have uh, over the years sort of like looked at it and I find it quite interesting. I, I'm definitely not a, a scholar of it, but, you know, just for my own sort of uh, life, I found it interesting. And mm. uh, I suppose in it, they talk about, um, so you have Brahman, which is just, I suppose, like maybe equivalent to this idea of substance, the most, it is just like the fundament of life almost. Mm. And then we are Atman and we are sort of like these drop, almost like a kind of like an asp, like a, uh, a distillation almost of Brahman. Yeah. And mm. in a way, it kind of makes it, it sense because I know that you've spoken about. Um, I think you said this intellectual love of God, and because didn't Spinoza talk about how one there's that I, I, you you've said it before this in the Latin, I think, but, but I can't was it amor intellectualis or something like this. Like the intellectualis, yeah. Right, right, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's very interesting connections. I mean, yeah. So Schopenhauer had a, a copy of the Upanishads that he read and influenced his philosophy. He said. Um, you know, Eastern thought, well, I mean, what, how do I start? So like I, I said, Rowan Raffson coined the term pantheism as opposed to panhylism, by which he meant non-mental matter. Um, he referred to the in, to Indian thought, to uh, feeders and the Brahman, Brahmanism, I think is the word he used in Latin. Um, and there is the, the very interesting overlap between um, Spinozism and um, Vedanta. The interesting question is whether what well, if there's an influence or basically if there's you know two convergent lines of evolution of thought there i know that in around the year 1800 um emerged the first european translations of the vedas or of, of indian thought um and that that you know slowly gradually had a big influence on on our thinkings starting really with schopenhauer in the west i think but i remember otto rudolf otto you know who is this theologian who wrote i mean the idea of the holy and whatever he said that um it's quite uncanny how fichte's philosophy now fichte was a philosopher um after kant before hegel kind of bridge him and schelling were the bridge between kant and hegel um otto wrote that fichte's philosophy is un un extraordinarily similar to eastern thought even though um otto didn't believe that fichte had any um any 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 contact with with those readers but you know so but going back indo-european thought i mean of course you know when you look at the ancient greek gods use and whatnot you know you find you find origins in in you know in in the east as well so uh very complicated um history um interestingly for me because i'm interested in psychedelic studies as well in the mid 20th century when lsd became popular you know a lot of thinkers went to the east to un to frame their experiences you know timothy leary alan watts people like this um as opposed to the west you know um and that's partly because at the time philosophy was at a very reductive stage and they didn't see much value in it unfortunately although you know you know generally speaking but yeah no there's there are these interesting overlaps um I think I generally prefer the Western approach just because it, uh, well, you know, I'm in the, I'm a Westerner and um, the language makes more sense to me. And there's reference to Descartes, who you've studied and so on and so forth. You know, like if you read the readers, they will make all these references, um, which you are, you know, cultural references, even which one is unaware. Mm. But yeah, no, quite a fascinating overlap. And maybe that's because it's true. <laughs> so that could be another reason why they're quite similar. Mm. Um, like I say, it's a quite a parsimonious view. But um. But yeah, also, you know, morally, it's quite interesting because Spinoza's Spinoza ultimately ends up in a sort of ethical pluralism where values do flood nature, of course, because um, every entity, which is uh, in panpsychism everywhere, has a kind of valuation valence system. But um, but there's not like one is 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 greater than the other. You know, there's not this object of good and evil that we find in Christendom. Um, and again, that seems to parallel Indian thought to a certain extent. But I'm not an expert in Eastern thought, so I'll, I'll I'll put a full stop to that now. But um, yeah. you know, fascinating parallels, absolutely. Yeah, very much. And um, the other thing I think, uh, encountering uh, Spinoza through yourself, and then just sort of having a, a look and kind of like, uh, you know, I've, I read a bit around, uh, you know, the Stanford Encyclopedia and stuff like that. I mean, I've not actually picked up his like ethics or anything, but in reading and as I say, sort of uh, hearing about his work, one of the things that really stands out to me is. He, um, how would you say, 
Well, like you say, he was when he when he espoused his ideas, he was, I think, like you said, renounced as an atheist, wasn't he? It was basically like, well, if you're saying God is nature, you're essentially an atheist. Yeah. And then it's really interesting because one of the uh, how do you see you, you often and it maybe it's a weak. Um, I'd, some might say it's a weak criticism of um, sort of uh, theists. But is that well, you're believing in something supernatural? Whereas Spinoza just sort of completely gets rid of that. And he's like, well, he says like, well, you can, you can have a belief in a God, but it's not supernatural. Yeah. So, yeah. So you can't define the supernatural until you've defined the natural, right? And what Spinoza is famous for is defining the, nat the natural or nature in a, a rather enriched way, a different way. So, yeah, he, as you say, he was accused of atheism and that's why um, he was actually considered um, harem, you know, <laughs> like unspeakable for 100 years because atheism was um prohibited in christendom at that stage and that's inter incidentally where you got these secret societies discussion society like the apostles in cambridge that i mentioned but also um i recently wrote an essay about john toland who was um the first used pantheist in english in 1705 1706 and um he wrote this book called the pantheisticon which was like a liturgy hello uh, sorry about that that's all right yeah, no, the John Toland's uh, Pantheisticon was a, was a liturgy uh, for a kind of like a ceremonial text for secret societies of philosophers in the sort of early 1700s. Um, but yeah, no, and, and John Toland was accused of being an atheist as well and or a deist, which is the notion that God, uh, we can only understand God through reason, uh, not through revelation. And um, God sort of created the world as it were and then let it roll by itself. So there was a lot of uh, confusion about these words, atheism, pantheism, deism in the 18th century and uh, and still today, I should say. So, yeah, the argument was, well, if Spinoza is saying that God is nature, that means there's no God, right? Because uh, you're just sort of getting rid of uh, God and saying that only nature exists. Well, that's not fair uh, because um, Spinoza puts forward a, an imminent rather than transcendent God. So yes, there's nothing outside of nature, but nature itself is divine. And and so the people who accuse Spinoza of atheism always assume that by nature, one means physical nature. But again, so for Spinoza, the physical uh, the extension, using Descartes' terms, um, is only one aspect of an infinity of aspects or expressions of the substance. So nature is much more than the physical. So and that's why um, it's unfair to call him an atheist, because, you know, he's not saying that only physical nature exists um, and no God. But he's saying that, you know, physical nature is just part of just one way of seeing this ultimate substance, which is which is God. And like I say, another reason he's not an atheist, which is very important, actually, is that of this idea of this infinite mind, this infinite intellect or related to that thought being infinite in itself so um just as our bodies are a finite part of infinite space so our minds are a finite part of infinite mind an atheist would not accept an infinite mind like this you know cosmic what has later sort of evolved into the term cosmic consciousness i don't think well mm. i think most atheists would accept that because mm. um and and but spinoza does you know um so so that's the reason why i think it's wrong to call him an atheist actually Yes, it's interesting because that makes me uh, think of which you've noted before as well. I in a podcast I listen to, but like there's that at times, yeah, there's like conflations are made between, for example, like materialism and atheism, you know, mm. and things like that. And it's like uh, you talk about Spinoza there, but then you've got, for example, Schopenhauer, who um, yeah, he, he was, was an atheist, a, but an idealist, right? Not a material yeah, materialist. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, well, you know, the re I think the reason for the Western dominance of materialism today is because of dualism, actually, ironically, which because, you know, with Descartes especially, yeah. although Descartes, if you read him in detail, is actually much more nuanced and and uh, much more intelligent than people people accuse him of being. But essentially, you know, he did um, bifurcate nature into uh, mind and matter as two separate substances. Okay. Um, although he was actually, you know, if you read him carefully, his intellect that was separate from 
from body, from matter, not um, emotions and senses and feelings, interestingly. That's following an old Aristotelian line. But anyway, by dividing um, mind and matter in this radical extreme way, um, you leave matter on its own, like completely dead. Um, before that, we were in this sort of, in the West, we were by this Aristotelian tradition, which sees, you know, like mind within nature to a certain extent, you know, you have the vegetative soul, so plants have a basic, you know, desire for, for you know, nutrients and so on. Um, but that was lost with the scientific revolution. Matter was seen as completely panhylal, like completely dead, completely insentient. And, um, and, uh, and that was good for, you know, like Descartes thought of matter as he was a mathematician as well, of course, a geometer. So, you know, you could calculate, um, what the external world was was going to do you know you can make predictions create technology it was very useful for the industrial revolution of course uh, and um useful for um the exploitation of nature to a certain extent because it had no intrinsic value so you could see understand why it happened but ultimately it's based on this metaphysical um idea that well yeah um mind is separate from from nature it's a duality so um so um or, or, so, or if you get rid of um the idea of the mind or the soul and god all you're left with is dead matter which is like an abstraction which was like i say a sort of in a way a legacy of dual dualism in the modern age at least i mean you do get it in ancient greece with democritus with something different there um and then you know as a result of that you get the hard problem of consciousness the mind matter mystery and so on you know how the hell do we get mind out of dead mindless matter you know and uh, it's quite interesting to trace the historical origins of of why that that view has sort of emerged only in the last few hundred years. You know, it wasn't ever it's never really a, um, a problem for the ancient Greeks because, like I said, they didn't differentiate matter so extremely, um, so ex in such an extreme fashion as opposed to mind. Mm. So, but yeah, no, Spinoza in a way is a return to that Greek thought. So, it's, although he's not, you know, depends who, which interpreter you speak to, but he, you know, he does fuse mind back into matter, and that's kind of yeah, panpsychism, pantheism, that we uh, yeah, and, and uh, there's a lot yeah. of um, there's a lot there um, which is uh, which I think um, at some point later we can talk about or another time is because uh, I think Whitehead picks up really uh, well on sort of some of those ideas around and he sort of you know his sort of uh overview or his i don't know what you call it, his system of thought kind of like furnishes a or offers a sort of um a set of dynamics or something which mm. perhaps uh help us understand well you know um things like consciousness and you know um and that, and, me and make us reflect i suppose on the axioms that we perhaps didn't even realize were axioms yeah. um just with Spinoza, though, because, you know, he, he called his book Ethics, didn't he? And I, th I think a lot of it ultimately, because am I right? whilst there is all this sort of like ontological kind of sort of uh, consequence or sort of it is ontological. Am I right in saying it was um, ultimately about sort of trying to live a, a, a better life? And he and he spoke. And the other thing is as well, didn't he? Because he was a determinist. But then he also in this in, at the same time sort of suggests one can kind of like cultivate uh, virtue or something right mm. yeah uh well it's called so his last book um was posthumous was called the ethics 1677 because essentially it's a virtue ethics you know that that following again an aristotelian line which is an ethics not a, not a morality way normative morality where you would say you know you ought to do this and that you know thou shalt do this it's rather like well what how do i lead a good life how do i how do i achieve this a tranquil state of mind so it's kind of you know stoical in that sense um and for spinoza to achieve that that tr tranquility of mind um one has one has to understand his metaphysics why because as you say he was a determinist so for him and this is where whitehead differs somewhat whitehead believes in a creative advance of the universe not a static determined universe but for spinoza then um god is perfect um, and uh, all the laws of nature are perfect as a result of that, almost by definition. And the future um, has to happen, has to be as it is. You know, there's no other way. So whatever happens had to happen. And as a result of that, very basically, um, you can't really blame people for their actions and you can't praise people for their actions. And if you reach that state of mind where you think, you know, well, you know, this guy had to do that, even though it's, it's resulted in, 
unfortunate this fortune for me um if you reach that stage where you can forgive basically you know you forgive everyone then um you've reached this ethical state of virtue you know of of uh, i see i see tranquility yeah and that's what einstein liked about it as well you know you get that in Schopenhauer as well to an extent yes yeah, but yeah I just, sure. well with the caveat that this determinism is not physicalist determinism or merely psychological determinism either so um just, just briefly, it's an interesting thing because in philosophy of mind, there's this big debate about mental causation, emergence, and whatnot. Um, so it's not like the mind um, makes the body move or the body makes the mind emerge. It's rather that body and mind are the same thing again, right? So when we talk about causation, it's physico-mental causation. Um, so a physical mental event has a cause and a physical co mental event at the next moment. Um, it's not physical to mental. Or mental to physical so yeah he is a determinist but he's not a materialist and there so there is mental causation but even that's determined you know so for spinoza mental causation is not free will but just to complicate matters further he does talk about freedom <laughs> and uh freedom ironically is to to achieve freedom is to understand that everything is necessary mm. it was like a paradox but you achieve freedom over your desires basically you're the bondage of the passions as he calls it by realizing that well you know you shouldn't worry about these things just take just be cool you know because that's the way the universe operates mm. and that's a, yeah and there's a certain help self-help in that book actually you know but obviously it's not for everyone yeah and but i think course, and that's uh... also just sorry just quickly that's also a reason why many um you know christians didn't like it because it gets you know there's no reason to send people to heaven and hell it's not their fault you there's no judgment involved in other words mm. in, yeah it's really interesting and it, it does sort of like uh you know i suppose it is kind of there's an a, the spirit of it almost is maybe yeah, not quite christian but maybe some more like eastern sort of uh approaches philosophies um but like yeah the sort of the letting go um you know, the sort of aligning one's own will with the will of the world. Mm. Uh, maybe almost that's like akin to like Taoism, you know, the way, you know, just sort of like not wrestling, I suppose, with things so much. Um, and that, yeah, sort of things are as they are. It's quite interesting. Yeah. But I've always considered this slightly problematic with Spinoza. So although, I, you know, yeah. <laughs> you I was going to ask you your thoughts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you go, go, yeah. Yeah, because, I mean, this is... So basically, Spino I always think of Whitehead as, you know, Spinoza plus Darwin equals Whitehead, you know, most basic terms, right? So in other words, you add a process to Spinoza and you get Whitehead. I mean, yeah, actually, you could make the same case for Hegel, to be fair. There's an interesting overlap between Hegel and Whitehead. But but um, <laughs> there's a, you know, a lot of the fatalism or the determinism in, in in spinoza is based on the fact that you know god is a perfect being and it's kind of an ontological argument at the start of the ethics but i've always struggled with this these kind of ontological arguments and the, the idea of perfection because it means completeness ultimately and um if you if you uh reject that this kind of um, idea that perfection means that things have to be the way they are and whatever you know by definition if you if you reject that because basically perfection is and completeness is uh, very vague terms then you are left open with the question as to whether maybe the future of the universe is open you know and and so then you get this opposition between determinism and novelty or creation and it's whitehead who takes creation and bergson likewise and um make a good case for that and you know with modern quantum physics of course it kind of corroborates that to some extent with uncertainty principles and whatnot and also arguments for the necessity of mental causation, which has an element of freedom in it. So, you know, Karl Popper, even, you know, famous for falsificationism, he he argued that um, there has to be some kind of mental, free mental causation. Otherwise, consciousness would not have evolved, mm. um, not only in humans, but in many different species, unlike spandrels. Mm. Uh, there must be some function of consciousness surely our intelligence has some effect upon the world you know on creating technology and cities and civilization surely our desires have some effect on our behavior right 
Um, the possibility of psychology, J1 Kim says, is based upon the existence of mental causation. You know, that subconscious drives um, influence your thoughts and behavior and so on. So there's a good case, good biological scientific case, evolutionary case to be made for the efficacy of mentality. So in other words, some kind of freedom. Of course, you're also determined by your genetics, epigenetics, you know, your language, your culture, and whatever, yeah. But an element of behavior. There is an argument to say that there's an element of freedom in, in what happens. And then, you know, you add Hume's kind of problem of induction, which is that, you know, how do we know that the laws of nature are absolutely set? We, we're basically generalizing from the particular. We see, you know, certain constant conjunctions, light traveling at a certain speed, and we think this is universal throughout space and time. But we haven't actually got the right, you know, to, to, to assert that because we haven't seen the future and we haven't been around the whole of space, right? So for Whitehead, the laws of nature fluctuate. You know, they are regularities in our epoch, epoch, but they are, we've got no right to assume they are absolute, you know. I mean, Whitehead goes even as far to speculate to that electromag we're in an electromagnetic phase of the universe at the moment. Even that might pass, and the three dimensions of space might be a sort of passing fad as well, right? <laughs> I mean, you know, in the in the cosmic scheme of things. So although he said, doesn't say this is at, this is necessary, he says this is a possibility. And uh, yeah, so that's that kind of um, openness I kind of like in, in Whitehead and Bergson, which you don't find in Spinoza. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, the sort of creativity and, um, well, I suppose, yeah, less perhaps deterministic. Um, I suppose just finishing up on Spinoza then, uh, I mean, I think on the Stanford, Wiki, uh, Stanford Encyclopedia, it's whoever wrote it said that they think he's perhaps the most relevant philosopher in the 21st century or mm. one of the most relevant. I mean, mm. do you think, yeah, th that's the case? I mean, what kind of are there, are there implications um, f for, for us, you know, perhaps um, in the way in which we live as a society, you know, perhaps like thinking about nature, and then also um, maybe we can, if you want to sort of touch on how it relates to psychedelics, because as you say, a lot of your work is on psychedelics, but I thought we could talk about that and maybe another point. Um, sure. But yeah, just on the sort of like Spinoza's effect and what, what kind of he can have to say about life. Yeah, no, I, well, I sort of agree. I mean, I would say, I would just qualify it by saying like neo-Spinozism is very relevant today, but just because of the slight kind of... Um, flaws I see in the system of, of its, I don't like the determinism basically of it, but um, although that's an important element of it. But yeah, no, I, th I think, um, like I say, we can do the whole of science, but on a neo Spinozan metaphysic, right? And it makes sense of everything in neuroscience, you know? Like I said, you'd expect, if mind and matter are the same thing seen from different perspectives, then you would expect the neural correlates of consciousness. Um, I think that also, panpsychism is not only although it seems radical when you first approach it i think eventually it just becomes just seems very very natural and uh parsimonious again you know and um essentially it's because we can't prove that the brain is a necessary and sufficient condition for consciousness that's not a scientific proposition it partly can't be a scientific proposition because mind is to an extent private in other words non-empirical right the problem of other minds um and there's of course like ethical implications of of seeing the world that way you know that uh the world then if if it's flooded with sentience it's kind of has its own intrinsic value and it's not of instrumental value just to humans so that has ecological benefits i think you know um this is actually the foundation of deep ecology from arna ness who wrote a book mm. about ecology in spinoza uh, uh, or, or an article about it in the 70s um on this very very um implication actually so, so in that ecological sense, it's very, very useful. Um, I think it, generally in the philosophy of mind, it's um, uh, much more parsimonious. Philosophy of mind, twentieth century has been basically physicalism attacking substance dualism. You know, that's essentially what it is. Um, but I think both of those, you know, we have to, you know, like with Spinoza, you transcend both of those um, options. Um, and uh, one, one, th one other thing I would say that. That that Whitehead adds to this. I see Whitehead as a, Whitehead as a neo Spinozan. I should say, right. Okay. I think one thing that he adds is this interesting notion that um, we um, absorb or we perceive feelings. We don't just 
um, emanate our own feelings. They're not only endogenous, but we actually perceive um, directly the past. The past moment of experience is um, a perception, and it's that is a perception of the the, the, la the feeling of the last moment, which basically fuses into the present moment. So, um, and I should say that feeling of the last moment comes from you know the body and the body in its external environment. So. It's a way of seeing um, the subject as intermeshed within nature. So it's not an endogenous theory of consciousness where um, I'm just projecting and presenting everything around me from my brain, like predictive processing theory today. It's rather that you're actually, yes, okay, you're, you're projecting to a certain extent, but you're also absorbing emotions around you. You're so, you know, within electromagnetism, there's this feeling for white heads, you know. So it's not like an extraneous supernatural force that you're absorbing is actually... The fact that, like I say, like I, it's, it's it's kind of this monism is quite radical if you really think about it. You know, electromagnetism itself, so light, has is just one perspective of feeling. So light itself, colours, they are I see. Uh, intrinsically uh, sentient. Um, so it's that absorption, just seeing things, you're absorbing emotions. I always think about this when people are sunbathing. You know, what's this? What is this uh, desire for for the sun? You know, that all animals seem to like and plants. It's not just simply um, uh, mechanical. It's uh, there's some some value in that sunlight itself. So um, yeah, I just think it's a it's a more enriched and also I should say therefore that um, ex that sort of overlaps with extended mind theories for e cognition, which is sort of doing the rounds at the moment in interesting ways. So it's just a way of uh, uh, thinking about the world where the world is sentient, it's uh, you know conscious or subconscious to certain extents. And it's intrinsically valuable. It makes mankind part of nature. It again, overcomes this bifurcation of mind and matter. You know, we are we are part of nature. We'd see that with Darwin, but with Whitehead, even more so. I, I think you know, we are like not only physically part of our physical surroundings, we're mentally part of our mental surroundings. Again, it's an implication of 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 monism. Um, so, an implication of monism really is this sort of extended mind theory. Interestingly. And I mm. think you know, so it's yeah, it's um, it's a it's a move away from dualism. If you want to put that in cultural terms, um, it's a move away from Christianity to a certain extent, because Christianity, you know, sees the world's nature as separate from a transcendental realm which is superior to it, and man as made in the image of God, which again is a a superior father figure. With Spinoza, you get a return to paganism in a way. You know, it's like um. It's a return to nature. Nature worship is too strong, but um, reverence for nature, I should say. Hmm. Uh, a return to Greece, you know, Rome, and the, the Stoics certainly. And uh, I see it as a sort of European future, really. And at the moment, uh, consequently, you can see Christianity, uh, science, as in the you know, as in the sort of still in the metaphysical grip of. This dualistic Christianity, of, yeah, yeah, of Descartes, really, isn't it? Like um, you spoke about that sort of and that bifurcation of like mind and matter, and actually, it was sort of, you know, we just took for hundreds of years, and you know, it's just taken to be true. It's 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 such a deep axiom, you know. It's like until you, I remember, do you know what? When I was preparing for this, it made me think. Um, and I, yeah, when we next talk, uh, it'd be great to talk more about Whitehead, yeah. um, and then psychedelics as well, and the sort of like how psychedelics can perhaps you know, inform and help us perhaps, well, both lead, how one perhaps needs, one can't get away from metaphysics. Metaphysics is always present and that can constrain how one integrates things like psychedelic experiences mm -hmm. and vice versa. But um, yeah, how it, w w w preparing for this and reading your work made me realize like, yeah, how deep some of these axioms are around mm -hmm. like th th that you have mind and the matter, because it made me think of this about eight years ago, I remember um, I was at work and um, I was talking to a colleague and she was into plants and she said, oh, yeah, you know, plants, they um, plants are conscious. And honestly, like I laughed like I genuinely and I'm not saying conscious is the quite right word. But, you know, that, I suppose what she was saying is that plants have feelings. And yeah. I laughed and I couldn't I genuinely couldn't get my head around. It. I thought this is completely mad. Yeah. Um, and yeah. somehow, yeah, just getting to a point, I suppose, by reading more and reading these different critiques. And and I think that's perhaps also what the hard problem of consciousness has done. It's really mm. distilled this sort of disjointed sort of, um, yeah, sort of picture. I was the same, you know, I, I thought, um, you know, 
I basically I thought, well, plants haven't got brains, have they? So how could they possibly be conscious? But then then you ask the question again. This is the neuroessentialist axiom that brains are necessary and sufficient for consciousness. You know, how do I know that to be true? Um again, it's not empirical, it's not empirically testable, is it, or falsifiable even. Um also, if you want to believe in machine consciousness, you know, some kind of artificial sentience, you would have to move away from the brain if you want to do that. Um, so, yeah, once you open up your mind to the possibility that there could be other substrates for consciousness, and when I say substrate, it may be the wrong word as well, because that's, that kind of implies that it's the substrate is the uh, uh, the sort of cause of, uh, of the mind. But uh, the parallel, you know, Spinoza's pansachism is, is often called in, in Spinoza circles parallelism. That, uh, yeah, you know, Fechner, Gustav Fechner, who's the, the founder of psychophysics um, and, a, and, a, and a panpsychist, he, he had this beautiful analogy of um, for panpsychism with mus musical instruments and music. He says, um, you know, like, you know, he, he's played all these uh, stringed instruments, the lute, the, lute, the guitar, and lutar as well as actually instrument and the harpsichord and whatnot and he and he notices that for music for sound you need stringed instruments you know which like are like neurons right and then suddenly he plays a flute and he realizes oh okay so you get wind instruments as well you don't need a strings for consciousness and he says the same for plants you know he still needs he needs nerve cells for uh humans but um why why you know plants have other kinds of cells and no reason to think that they are not associated with consciousness mm. And it's a kind of anthrop um, anthropocentrism that we have. Again, I think there's a Christian basis of that, which is that only only mankind has a soul, has souls. Only people have souls. This is Descartes' view as well. Interestingly, you know, not even mammals for him. Other mammals. Um, and uh, and that's why we kind of laugh, you know, uh, when we first hear this idea that well, plants plants are conscious, even though that was con that was considered normal common sense until the 17th century in Europe, you know. Like I say, with the vegetative soul of, of Aristotle. Um, but yeah, no, it's funny, isn't it? Nietzsche's great because he brings out how our Western values are very much seated in Christianity, even if you say God is dead, you know, you still uh, are not aware of how successful Christianity has been in flooding Western culture with its own values. And its real victory is when you think that these values are universal values rather than Christian values. That's the beauty of Nietzsche, he really undercuts that assumption. With Whitehead, he does kind of the same thing for metaphysics, I think. You know, it's like you don't realize that science really is in the grip of of this kind of um this dualism that we see in from our religion mostly. You know, not only the religion, but yeah. We yeah, basically we're living in the Christian, we're still living in Christianity, um, to the extent that it's victorious and is ostensibly losing churches and whatever, but actually its way of thinking is still prevailing mm. and permeates science as well or yeah. you know or it's interesting yeah. yeah i mean you know to be, hume actually made this point to some extent you know he was critic he's known as a critic of religion but he's also a critic of science um we don't realize i think the extent of religion within science um in the west but that's where philosophy comes in metaphysics comes in and sort of makes these questions these 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 kind of priors as scientists mm. call it presuppositions mm. uh and that's what that's what's fascinating about reading these people, these metaphysicians, you know, it's like, oh, yeah, OK, well, I never thought about that. Maybe there's something in it. And then you begin to question your own assumptions and it changes you over time. Yeah, I'm just mindful of the time. Mm. Um, uh, yeah, duh. <laughs> um, so maybe we leave it there. Let's leave it there. But let's come back. Definitely. I really enjoyed this. Yeah. Interesting. Um, yeah. Brilliant. Points you're making. Uh, let's just schedule another date. Yeah. Uh, yeah, sure. To go now, but, um... Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. As I say, because there's, you know, it'd be great as well to talk more about Whitehead and psychedelics, and then also how that then just bears upon the zeit, the kind of current zeitgeist and stuff. And um, yeah. yeah, all right. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, um, how about like early December, maybe? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. W whenever suits you, really. Okay. Yeah. November's a bit busy, uh, but I. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, we'll arrange something. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. All right. Well, um, yeah, thanks um very much, uh, Peter. And um, yeah, I hope you have a lovely day and uh the rest of your week and everything. Thank you very much. Yeah, Halloween week. So uh <laughs> it's gonna be fun. I hope you do as well. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, yeah, try again sometime.
Yeah. Okay. And let me know when this is up, and uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, um, I'll, um, yeah, help you advertise it, whatever, if you want. Yeah. Brilliant. All right. Thanks so much. Okay, George. Well, I'll see you. I'll see you in a month or so. Cool. Great. All right then. Look forward to it. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Bye.